Greetings, citizens. Hey you, hey you, beautiful, creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this craziness today, you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Brad or Steen, whichever you prefer. And today we're going to be discussing the horrible double murder of Alan and Diane Johnson committed at the hands of their own 16 year old daughter, Sarah Marie Johnson. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you want. They're both Bratterstein, but no pressure. All right, now that I'm done begging you to join my cult, we can get into this video. Now, this is a video on a case that was suggested to me by a subscriber named Shani, or Chani, C-H-A-N-I. So thank you, Shani Chani, for your suggestion. And wow, 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 woey, woey. I had never heard of this case before, and it was very interesting to look into. So this is a case of parasite, which is when a child kills their parents. And I did not realize that this was like a super rare thing. We do hear about it from time to time. I've covered a couple of cases like this, but the reason you've heard of the cases that you've heard of is because it is so rare that when it happens, people are like, what the fuck? Because of overall murders across the board, parasites make up a super small percentage and parasites committed by underage females, like Sarah Marie Johnson, almost non-existent. Because of that, it was a very interesting case to dive into. I read so many things. I watched so many things and I, I just kept diving in. There was something about it. I could not seem to consume enough. So now my head is swollen with information on this case. And I guess I did the work. So now you don't have to, you can sit back, you can pop your feet up, keep them elevated uh, because that's good for you when you're pregnant. Um, and you can sit back and hear about this horrendous crime I'm going to tell you about today. With all that said, I guess it's time that I stop talking about it and start being about it or start talking about what I said I'm going to talk about. So come gather around and let me tell you the story of the horrible double murder of Alan and Diane Johnson by their 16 year old daughter, Sarah Marie Johnson. Okay. Now where do we begin? I guess we can begin in 2003 because that's where our story takes place. Duh. And up until this year, 46 year old Alan Johnson and his 52 year old wife, Diane Johnson had been living a pretty sweet life. The two had been together for 20 years. They were part-time lovers and full-time friends, if you know what I mean. And they had created a really good life together. Alan was part owner of a landscaping company and Diane worked for a medical clinic and the couple made a comfortable living for their family with a nice house on a spacious two acre parcel of land on the outskirts of Sun Valley, Idaho, a very bougie area where most people came to vacation and only the ones with like dollar dollar bills y'all could afford to actually live. So they were doing good. They were comfortable. Both Diane and Alan were well known in their community and they were known for being like really rad people. They were friendly. They often had parties. They had a lot of friends within their community. Diane was described as vivacious and curious, loyal and friendly. She was said to be the exact type of friend anyone would be lucky to have. And she was married to Alan, the man of men, the type of guy all other men admired and respected and looked up to. And he was described as just being an honest and straightforward dude. And the couple as a unit were known as being just really great parents to their two children. First was the couple's son. His name was Matt. And at the time that this happened, he was 22 years old and he was away at college, living away at college at this time. And when he was interviewed after the fact, he said his parents were just really awesome, that they were each other's best friend, which is exactly what you would want. I imagine in parents is to have your mom and dad be best friends with each other because they loved each other so much. And he said that he and his dad were super close that when he still lived in the house, they did everything together. And that he described his mom as the type of woman who could literally make anyone smile. So these people just sounded like they were pretty awesome people. And their second child was a daughter who was 16 at the time. This was Sarah Marie Johnson and Sarah and her brother, Matt were very, very close growing up. They had a good life. Sarah Marie Johnson was born January 24th, 1987. And she grew up in Bellevue, Idaho and attended Wood River High School. 
Growing up, she was a little bit of a tomboy. She especially loved to attend the gun range to practice her shooting skills with her father because she was said to be a bit of a daddy's girl and daddy was into shooting guns. So daddy's girl was into shooting guns. She was academically inclined with dreams of being a teacher one day and she was very athletic as well. She played basketball and volleyball and was even on the debate team because she had a brain on her. She was popular and she was well liked and from at least the outside point of view, it seemed like she had a pretty sweet gig, a pretty, they, they, she had a wonderful life, right? It seems like they all did. Now, this all changed just after Labor Day weekend in 2003. And this is when both Alan and Diane were brutally murdered in their own home. So sometime just after 6 a.m., Diane, who was still in bed, all covered up, snug as a bug in a rug, was shot in the head with a rifle and murdered. And her husband, Alan, who had been in the shower, was shot in the chest while he was still in the shower and the bullet went through his chest and hit the bathroom wall behind him. He was either just getting out of the shower or just in, you know, like he shower door was open, he was getting out. He was shot in the chest and went through him and hit the wall behind him. Diane was said to have died instantly. Her head wound was very intense. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And Alan was still alive when he was first shot because he made it from the bathroom and walked into the room a little bit, probably trying to get to his wife and ended up collapsing on the floor where he bled to death. The couple's daughter, Sarah, who was the only other person home at the time, ran from the house in pure terror. And she ran to a neighbor's home where she called the police. And when police arrived, they went into the home and they found the whole bloody scene. It was described as one of the worst scenes that any of these officers had ever seen. And when they went in, Diane was found deceased still in her bed and Alan was found deceased on the floor of the bedroom. When police initially arrived, they thought that they were looking at a murder suicide because again, this was one of the worst scenes that they had ever seen and they couldn't really think of any other explanation. But once they looked at where the bodies were located in the proximity of the murder weapon, the rifle to the bodies, they realized that this just simply couldn't be the case and it had to be a murder. And when they searched the scene, they also found a bunch of knives, like not a bunch, I think there were three knives um, in the bedroom at the murder scene. But this was very weird because neither victim had sustained any sort of, nobody had been stabbed. So they were like, what are these knives here for, bro? I really don't know. And uh, it, it gets explained a little bit later, maybe. But at the time they were just like, this is a really fucking weird crime scene. I don't know what I'm looking at here. So police immediately shut shit down. They knew like they needed to close off the scene and they closed off the, the streets so that nobody could be driving in and out. And this ended up being a really good call on their part because there was a trash truck. There's a trash truck, my God, <sighs> baby brain. There was a trash truck that was going down the street that was going to be going to the Johnson's house next. So they stopped all in and out traffic, which ended up being good because there was key evidence found in the Johnson's trash can that was out on the curb ready for trash day that ended up being useful in the case. Inside this trash can, they found a bloody, like a blood splattered, spattered, blood spattered pink bathrobe. They also found a left-handed leather glove and a right-handed like doctor glove. What is that? Latex glove, latex glove. And all of these items had someone's DNA on them. Inside this trash can, they also found bullets that were determined to have belonged to the murder weapon. So that was something very useful. And they also found a pregnancy test that was a bit odd. When they searched the home, they found the, um, the pair, the leather glove, his mate, <laughs> just like this one, but opposite, not an evil twin, but you know, the opposite leather glove, uh, in Sarah's bedroom. They also found the, uh, rifle, the murder weapon in the master bedroom. And when Sarah was searched, like looked at, spoken to, they found that she had a pretty gnarly bruise on her shoulder that developed because of what they believe was the recoil from the rifle. So when police questioned Sarah, because obviously they're going to question Sarah, she's the only one there at the time. She says that what happened was that she was in her room when she could hear like the shower running and things going on in the house because it was like early in the morning and she was waking up when all of a sudden she heard a loud bang. She said that at that, she got up and she like went to her parents' bedroom door that was closed. And she kind of like knocked on the door, like called out to her mom and dad before she heard another loud bang and got horrified. So she ran from the house to go to her neighbors. So police ended up asking Sarah about the pink bathrobe because when they looked, the one that was found in the trash can outside covered in blood, because when they looked at it, they were like, this 
definitely looks like it would belong to like a 16 year old girl. And who are we questioning right now? But, um, a 16 year old girl. So they ask her about the, the rope, like if it belonged to her, et cetera, et cetera. And her response, which they found to be very odd was, I didn't kill my parents. And they were like, thank you for that information. Not really what we asked, but um, thank you for divulging that out of nowhere. So they were definitely a little bit suspicious of her. And that was like a red flag that they took note of, but they weren't immediately thinking that Sarah was the trigger man. Uh, they were interested in a couple of other people. First was a housekeeper that Sarah had told police had recently been let go, had been fired because her parents discovered this person was stealing from them. And another was a 19 year old man named Bruno Santos. And the reason that police were suspecting him is because when they were interviewing people, interviewing members of the family, a lot of them said that they thought Bruno Santos could have been the guilty party. Now, who was Bruno Santos and how was he connected to this case at all? If he was, how was he connected to this family? 19 year old Bruno Santos was 16 year old Sarah's new boyfriend. The two had been dating for about three months at the time of the murders and her parents were not about it. Bruno was an illegal immigrant from Mexico, which I'd like to believe was not the reason for their disapproval, but it is mentioned like a ton when you look into this case. Um, but what I personally think was a big reason that they weren't into him were a couple of other things. One, the age difference. Bruno was 19 years old. So there's a three year difference between him and their underage daughter's age. And he was known as being a bit of a bad boy who exclusively liked younger girls, which they were not about. They were like, mm, maybe we don't do that. Maybe we don't fuck with that. The next reason that I think was an issue for them because they were more of an elite, you know, well off and educated family was that Bruno was a high school dropout from a less fin financially elite side of town. And the next reason is that he was known as being a bit of a drug dealer. So those were a couple of things that I think her parents were just like, not really about. The relationship between Sarah and Bruno was a big point of contention in the Johnson household because they did not approve of him. They weren't quiet about how they felt. And it caused a lot of fights, a lot of arguments through the entirety of their relationship because like people just were not down with the Bruno Santos sickness and they weren't quiet about it. And nobody thought that she should be dating him. And it wasn't just Sarah's family. Even her friends were like, mm, maybe, maybe we don't. One of her friends was interviewed. This is a girl named Syringa, Syringa Stark. And she said of Sarah and Bruno's relationship. And I quote, I just felt like she could do better. He was a high school dropout and was selling drugs and she was from a nice family. It just didn't seem like it was right. But Bruno and Sarah were seemingly happy and seemingly in love. Sarah even showed her friends engagement rings that the two had bought together and openly discussed that the two were ba 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 banging. So ain't nobody want to see them together, but it don't matter now. Cause I got you. Babe. That's the, the vibe that they were putting out into the world. So apparently things came to a head with all this relationship drama just before Labor Day weekend. And this was when Sarah had told her family she was going to be spending the night at a girlfriend's house. And they were like, cool, that's great. Go have fun. But then sometime in the night, Sarah's mom, who I imagine probably suspected that her daughter was not at her girlfriend's house, called over to the girlfriend's um, home. Like ring, ring, ring. Hello. Yes. Can I speak to my daughter, Sarah? And they were like, yeah, she's not here. She said she was lying. And they were like, fucking knew it. Like I knew it. I knew that little, I knew she was lying. So they suspected that she was probably with Bruno Santos, which in their minds was not good. And lying to your parents and staying somewhere other than where you say you're going to be is not a cool thing to do. Don't do it. It's not safe and it's not respectful. That's that on that. So they decide that they're going to go and catch her and they decide they're going to mob on over to Bruno's home. So it's actually Sarah's dad, Alan and Sarah's uncle who drive on over to Bruno's house. And when they get there, they knock on the door and they find that Sarah is there and Alan's fucking pissed. He's super upset about it. And he confronts Bruno and is yelling right in Bruno's face. I don't know if he's yelling or if he's speaking sternly like a papa. I wasn't there, but basically what the conversation was, was like you, sir, who are an adult need to stay away from my daughter. Like, that's it. This is it. Like, this is done. If you do not, 
I'm going to call the cops. I'm going to let them know that you're having sex with an underage girl and I'm going to have you deported back to Mexico. He wasn't playing around. And Sarah's uncle who was present during this conversation said of this whole situation. And I quote, he was completely disgusted as anyone would be when they find out their kid is doing something stupid. But though Alan made threats of calling the police, he never actually did it. And this was on Saturday. And by Tuesday, Alan would be murdered in what the county sheriff called one of the most horrifying and brutal crime scenes that they had ever seen. To illustrate how bad this was, the defense attorney said later at the trial of this crime scene, and I quote, there was blood and hair on the carpet. It was on the ceiling. It was on the walls. There was part of a skull cap in the hallway. After leaving Bruno's house that night, Alan let Jeff Jessica. Don't know who that is. There's no one in this case named Jessica. Alan let Sarah know that she was grounded indefinitely. He took away her house keys and he told her that she was to stay in the guest house on the property. They had like a back house that was rented out to a tenant, but the tenant who I guess they must've been friends with, because like if I was a tenant and my landlord did what they're about to do, I'd be like, what the fuck? But he told her to go stay in the guest house while the tenant was away. Um, and that that's all she could do was just stay there and be there. And Sarah was surprisingly okay with this. She was mad. It was clear that she was upset, but she didn't yell. She didn't scream. She didn't fight it. She was just like, okay, cool. And went and stayed in the guest house. And this was unusual for her because her brother said that everything with her was an explosive fight. Like anytime she didn't get her way, it was like she was trying to stomp her feet through the ground um, during fights. And this time she was cool as a cucumber. Now back to the scene after the murder. So Matt, the son, had been away at college when this happened. And as soon as he heard that something had happened, he hurried home and he arrived to find a hearse parked at his family's house. That's what he came home to was a hearse taking away the murdered bodies of his parents. And he was just traumatized. And at first he was like wondering if maybe it was just a dream, if it was just like a really bad dream. But then he was enveloped in a circle of hugs from his family members who had already gotten there and were waiting for him. And he was like, oh fuck, like this is real life. And he, like a lot of the other family members who were there were already feeling like and discussing the fact that they thought that Bruno Santos was involved. In their minds, they were like, why else would this have happened? Why would they be murdered right after having this fight? Why would Sarah have been spared if this wasn't Bruno? And he must have just been super pissed because Alan and Diane were not going to let him and Sarah be together and they were threatening to deport him. So he took care of his problem. So as the family gathers and more and more members of the family, more friends show up at the house and start talking, they're all talking about Bruno and everyone that police talk to, they're talking about Bruno. So police are very interested in this Bruno Santos and they are convinced that his DNA is going to be a match for the items that have been found in the trash can in front of the family's home. So the police on the scene actually send a team out to try to locate Bruno so they can question him. Where you been? What you doing? All that jazz. But while they're at the crime scene, who shows up? I feel like this, I feel like this has happened recently in a couple cases that I've done, um, where they like want to question somebody and then the person they want to question just shows up. So he shows up at the crime scene. They're like, Hey, Bruno, just who we've been looking for. Can you do me a favor? And can you hang out a bit? Let's talk. Let's wrap. I'd love to know your alibi. I would love to take your DNA. That'd be great. So they get a warrant for his DNA. They take it, they test it. And to everyone's surprise, Bruno is not a match for, for the DNA found in the trash can. He, his DNA is not found anywhere at this crime scene. And he has an alibi for the time of the murders. Oh, and just for the record, the housekeeper that Sarah had initially said could have been disgruntled, you know, uh, the one that was fired for stealing and the tenant who lived in the back house, um, both end up being ruled out as suspects. I don't get into them a lot in this because like it hardly matters. Um, but do remember the tenant in the guest house? Cause he does come back in a little bit, but they both were ruled out as possible suspects in the murder. So while police are still kind of focusing on Bruno, her friends and family, Sarah's friends and family start to notice something odd with Sarah and the way she is acting and police notice this too. So Sarah seems, seemed to people who knew her, like she was putting on an act, like she was hamming it up and seeming sadder than she actually was. Um, 
and it rubbed people the wrong way. There was one instance where Sarah was like hugging her grandma and like crying and like rubbing her back. And then she sees a friend of her show up at the scene and she calls the friend over. And as soon as the friend walks over, it's like the tears completely shut off. And she whispers in this friend's ear. And what she whispers is to please go check on Bruno. And a couple members of her family caught this interaction and found it very odd. And the friend who she had whispered to, this was a girl named Megan. Megan thought it was odd too. And she later said of this at trial, this moment at trial, and I quote, on the day of the murders, when she was hugging her grandma, Pat, she mouthed to me to go check if Bruno was okay. And the thing that Sarah did that put investigators sort of on edge is that when they were wheeling Alan and Diane's bodies out of the house, Sarah seemed completely unaffected. She was cold and she was distant. She just sat on a wall and watched them wheel the murdered bodies of her parents out of the house. The one she had just been in the home supposedly when this happened and she should have been traumatized, right? Like that's what people would have expected. I know you can't really say how people are going to act in a situation like this, but the way she act, just watching them wheel by with no issue whatsoever, definitely stuck out to investigators. One of the officers on scene said of this moment, and I quote, I said, there's something going on here. I mean, most 16 year olds would be hiding. They would not want to sit there on a fence and watch their parents come out in body bags. No way. After talking to family more and after talking to people who knew Sarah and her parents more and learning about the heated arguments that they would have and how often things got to be explosive between Sarah and her parents, particularly when discussing Bruno, they started to wonder if maybe Sarah could have been involved in these murders. So they end up bringing her in and they take her fingerprints, they take her DNA and they question her. And even though there was no sign of a break in, there was no fourth century. And even though both of her parents had taken out some pretty good um, life insurance policies on themselves, which would have left their children, Sarah included, pretty comfortable. Uh, Sarah denied everything. She denied any involvement she completely stuck to the story that an intruder had come into her home and had murdered her parents. But at this point, police were like, see what we think happened. They didn't say this to her, but this is what was going through their heads. They're like, well, what we actually think is that you, Sarah murdered your parents in a fit of rage after they told you you couldn't see Bruno anymore and threatened to have him deported. You felt like your relationship was in jeopardy. So you murdered them and you were hoping to get that life insurance money and then to just run off into the sunset with your boyfriend with no repercussions. Police believed this, but they didn't have proof yet. They didn't have enough to arrest her. So since they couldn't arrest her and she was newly orphaned, she was sent to live with her aunt and uncle, which I believe was her mom's sister and her mom's sister's boyfriend, boyfriend, husband. They were married. And this was weird for them because it, by this time, Sarah's family, a lot of her family members are starting to wonder if she's guilty as well, because they're seeing everything that comes out seems to point to her. They know that it wasn't Bruno and they don't have a lot of other people to suspect. So these people bring Sarah into their home, even though they believe it's possible that she's a murderer. So they believe that they have a killer under their roof while they sleep at night. Her aunt who let her live with her said of this suspicion, and I quote, Every time she went in to be interrogated by police, her story kept changing. And this was true. Her story did keep changing. She would change little details like what she was doing when she heard the gunshots, um, whether she was asleep or not, because first she heard the shower, then she was asleep. But when she heard the first shot, she told police that she had gotten up to run to check her parents' bedroom, but that when she left her room, she closed her door and she didn't go back in there. But when they searched the home, they found that her mother's blood, Sarah's mother's blood, Diane's blood had spattered into Sarah's room. There was blood in Sarah's room, but if she had closed the door and not gone back in there, how could this have happened? It was just a lot of little things that were making people suspicious because they thought these are things that you should remember. And when police would bring these inconsistencies to her attention, she would stick to her story and she'd have no explanation for them. And she also just didn't seem to be affected or traumatized by what happened. And people found this to be incredibly odd. And her aunt that she had stayed with said of this also, and I quote, when we would be discussing Alan and Diane and someone would get upset, she would roll her eyes and act 
disgusting. She, <laughs> this girl. It's like if you, okay, if you did this, you would think you would try to hide it better, but she just really didn't. She just didn't give a fuck, man. Like apparently even at her parents' memorial service, right? She was there and she wasn't acting sad. She wasn't crying. And she had even asked if she could like leave to go to a volleyball game afterwards. Like that's what she wanted to do immediately after the funeral of her parents. And her aunt had even overheard her the day of the funeral. Um, she was like going to get her hair and her nails done for the service. And she overheard Sarah telling somebody who worked there that she just wanted to quote, get on with her life. So all of these little things were just rubbing people the wrong way and putting a bad taste in their mouth. Oh my God. I almost forgot the dream, <laughs> the dream. Okay. So Sarah had a weird dream while she was staying with her aunt and her uncle. And she divulged this dream to her aunt and her aunt talked about it at trial. And I think this dream is incredibly creepy and incredibly telling. And let me know if you agree. I almost forgot about this and I cannot believe I almost forgot about this. Cause this was like very like to me. And I think it will be to you as well. Sarah told her aunt that she had a dream that she was walking up to her aunt and uncle's house. But once she went through the door, she was in the home that she had shared with her parents. And she said her mom and dad were there, but that when she looked at her mom, her mom's face wasn't there. It was like the, the area where her face would have been was like digitally blocked out. Okay. Her mom was suffered a head wound. She said her father was also there and that he had the same thing with his chest, that his chest was digitally blocked out. He was shot in the chest. And apparently she did not see these, um, these injuries. Cause remember she ran out of the house when she heard the shots. So she's having a dream about this. Um, she said that in her dream, she wanted to hug her dad, but that she couldn't do it because she didn't want to hurt him. And that in response, he said to her, and I quote, you can't hurt me anymore. Does that not make the hair on the back of your arms, the back of your neck, the back of where the fuck ever just like stand up on end. Is that not such a creepy dream? Sir, ma'am, no. So it wasn't just Sarah's family that was starting to be suspicious of her. Her friends were starting to be suspicious of her as well. They would kind of look at the situation. They'd look at how she'd act. She'd act. She'd be acting though. And they'd be like, this seems a little bit suspicious. Like the fact that she was more preoccupied with hanging out with friends, hanging out with Bruno, with getting her hair done and her nails done in the, in what should have been like, intense grief. And they found it to be odd. And one friend in particular had a very weird interaction with her that made her feel like, Oh fuck, this girl is guilty. And this was an interaction that she had with a friend named Shanti. Sh Shanti. Wait a minute. Wasn't that the name of our, sus of our subscriber who suggested this case? Wait, hold a minute. Hold a minute. Let me go through my notes here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. No, our subscriber suggestions name was Shawnee C H A N I. And the friend is C H A N T E. But I was like, what for a minute, for a minute, I was like, are we speaking to somebody who knew this girl? Cause that would have been very cool to know. We are not moving on. Anyways, this girl Shanti said of a moment that she and share, she and Shara shared after a volleyball game that happened after the murders. And I quote, she came up to me and said, Shanti, please find Bruno and tell him I love him no matter what happens. Shanti said at that moment that her heart just dropped and that she knew that Sarah was responsible for her parents' murder. She said she couldn't believe that Sarah would be more concerned with Bruno and his feelings and of seeing him and things like that um, than she was about her parents being murdered and somebody not being caught for it yet. Like she didn't seem to be curious about who might have done that at all because allegedly she knew. And she also told Shanti that like she couldn't call her and she couldn't call Bruno herself because she was under surveillance. And she thought this was odd too. Cause she's like, what do you have to hide? Like, why can't you have these conversations? So while all this is happening, police are still diligently working on putting the case together. They're looking at everything they have. They're looking at the evidence they have, how it fits together. If it fits with the idea that Sarah is the culprit, etc., etc. What they had was the bullets that they found in the trash can, the robe that was covered in blood and belonged to Sarah that was determined to have gunshot residue inside the right sleeve, the two gloves, both that contained DNA that was in the process of being tested, a pair of wool socks that were taken from Sarah the day of the murders that had blood on the bottoms, 
live bullets determined to also be from the murder weapon that were found inside Sarah's room and the murder weapon itself that was a 264 Winchester Magnum rifle. And it was determined that this gun belonged to the tenant who lived in the guest house. Now remember, this tenant, though this gun belonged to him, he was determined to have had an alibi and to not have even been in the area. He was like in a totally different area at the time these murders occurred. But also remember that after Sarah got in a fight with her parents when they confronted Bruno, where was Sarah sent to stay? In the guest house where this gun was kept so she did have access. Now, police got their first big break in this case when the law, lob, uncaught jobs, when the lab called the police and were like, yo, Mr. Policeman, we have a match for that DNA that was found on that pink robe and also those two gloves that you pulled from the trash can. And they were like, oh my God, that's great. Who is it? Like they knew, but they were like, but who is it? We don't know who is it. And the lab guy was like, well, it is none other than Sarah Marie Johnson. And they were like, fuck yeah, this is awesome. And one of the investigators said of this moment and getting this realization, this confirmation, and I quote, when the state lab came back and they said, we have Sarah's DNA inside the glove, we said, there it is. We got her. Which I, I will say, I will say it does sound a little tunnel vision-y. Like they seemed like they wanted her, right? But it also seems like all the stuff was pointing towards her and this was just confirming what they believed to be true. But I will acknowledge that it does feel a little tunnel vision, tunnel, tunnel vision-y. But I also think she did it and I think they proved it. So it's like, I don't know how to feel. This was very hard on Sarah's family, as I'm sure you can imagine. When her grandfather asked police, like, who was the person who pulled the trigger, if not Bruno, and they told him that it was Sarah, it was a crushing realization because the family had been suspecting her, right? They had had a feeling that she was responsible, but of course they were hoping that that was not the case. And now they had confirmation that yes, this was the case. Even her own brother had started to be like, oh, fuck, I think it might be her, but they weren't sure. They didn't have that like proof that it was her. And now they did. And that realization, that realness was, it just had to have been soul crushing. I cannot even imagine being in that situation. And her grandmother said of this realization, and I quote, it takes a lot of evidence to convince a grandma that her granddaughter killed her daughter. I mean, it had to be overwhelming. So police now believe they have enough to arrest Sarah, but they want, they want a confession. They want that little bit more. So they decide to take one more stab at her and to try to confront her with everything they have to get her to confess to the crime. So they bring her in and they question her and they interrogate her and they interrogate her. And after 45 minutes, it's very clear to them that they're not going to break her. So they make the decision to arrest the 16 year old teenager, which must have been just such a weird thing, like to arrest a kid for a double murder. That's got to be super weird. Weird or not, though, Sarah Marie Johnson was arrested on October 30th, 2003, nearly two months after her parents were killed. And she was charged with two counts of first degree murder, which was punishable by 10 years to life in prison or by death. She was held with a $2 million bail and she was being tried as an adult and she pled not guilty to both counts. Sarah's arrest made headlines everywhere. The fact that a teenage girl murdered both her parents in such an intense way was such an unheard thing, unheard of thing that it blew everybody's minds. As I said in the beginning of this video, it's called parasite and it's very rare. And typically if it happens at all, it's not committed by daughters, it's committed by sons, and it's usually people who are older. But in this case, it was a girl and an underage girl. And that is crazy. That's like something that just hardly ever happens. And if it does happen, more often than not, the girl will employ, implore. <sighs> She'll get a guy to help her do it. She'll get a boyfriend, a guy who really likes her, somebody else to do the dirty work for her. But her being the person who actually pulled the trigger was insane for people and they couldn't wrap their minds around it. They were like, how did this girl from this well-off family with no history of mental illness, no abuse, nothing going on in her family, how did she go to such an extreme? It just didn't make sense to anybody and they could not wrap their heads around that this was real. It was like very hard for them to believe. So the prosecution had their work cut out for them because people just, 
it didn't compute. The trial ended up being a bit of a circus too because they ended up having to move venues um, because it was thought that Sarah would not get a fair trial if they stayed at the courthouse in their area. And that ended up being true because when they were like looking at prospective jurors in Blaine County, a ton of them ended up getting disqualified because they either knew Diane and Alan too well or knew Sarah too well or knew the case too well. The trial finally did begin in February of 2005 and the prosecution was feeling confident that they had enough physical evidence um, to convict Sarah, but they were not confident that they'd be able to convince a jury that this bright, charismatic, 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 athletic, well-liked popular girl from an affluent neighborhood with a good life and a good family could just so easily flip the switch and become such an intense, aggressive, brutal, ruthless murderer. They did not feel confident they were going to be able to convince some normal thinking human beings that this could have been possible. The prosecution did believe though and painted a picture for the jury of a girl, Sarah, who was fucking pissed. She was mad at her parents. She was pissed at her parents for interfering in her relationship for the last time. Her relationship of three months, mind you, like so stupid, but that she was pissed and that when her dad threatened to have Bruno deported, she got even more mad because she thought that this might actually happen and her relationship was threatened. And while she was in that guest house, she saw that rifle that belonged to the tenant and she started thinking like, hmm, that could be useful. And she started putting a plan together in her, in her head, a plan where she would ruthlessly murder both of her parents, get the life insurance money, and then run into the sunset free to marry Bruno Santos without incident. To strengthen this theory um, at trial, the prosecution talked about how Sarah and Bruno were engaged to be married. And prior to being arrested, Sarah was asked about this and she denied it. She was like, no, we were never engaged. That wasn't a thing. So at trial, the prosecution brought up Sarah's friend Megan to testify to prove that Sarah had been lying. And Megan told the court that yes, Bruno and Sarah were engaged, that Bruno had proposed to Sarah at like a dinner that they had had for the volleyball team, and that Sarah and Bruno had even driven out to Boise to pick out their engagement rings. Like there was a plan for them to get married. And the whole time Megan testified to this, Sarah just fucking rolled her eyes into the back of her head. This trial, like, so the murder was already tearing this family apart, right? Like the idea that th this whole family has lost two people that were so important to them. And the fact that somebody that they loved was on trial for doing it. But then they were further ripped apart when like members of the family had to testify against Sarah during the murder trial. So they had to make this decision on if they believe she was guilty or not and to decide if they want to try to help her or if they want to try to get justice, if they really think it's her. And it's so sad because even Sarah's brother, Matt testified against his sister at trial and told them about the relationship Sarah had with his parents and about how often they would fight and what they'd fight about and how explosive it would get and how volatile it was and how often Sarah would talk about how she just hated her mother and that just must have been really hard for him. I can't imagine being in that situation. And then, oh, and then what pissed me off so much is that Sarah's attorney, the defense attorney, tried to say that the only reason that Matt was testifying against his sister, okay, was to ensure that she got arrested so that he could get the whole $500,000 life insurance policy to himself because she'd be in jail. And that's so fucked up. Sometimes defense attorneys can be ruthless sons of bitches, right? Like you don't need to pull other people under the bus to defend your client. Like that's so messed up. And it made me so mad to read because this guy's already going through so much. And then to have this guy say that, I was like, what a asshole. And obviously Matt was like, no, that's not it. He denied it completely. And he's like, actually like the real reason is because I'm just trying to get justice for my parents who were murdered. I feel like that little meme of that girl with the hairbrush. <sighs> that bullshit. He ended up telling the court that his mom and his sister did not get along, that they were always rocky, especially recently, that they didn't see eye to eye, that things would get explosive, that they would fight. And then at one point, things it recently had gotten so bad that while they were fighting, Diane slapped her daughter in the face. And in response to that, 
Sarah attacked her mother, and it got so intense and so brutal that Alan had to physically break them apart. So, it sounds real, real not tight. It sounds like not, no one was having a good time. Straight up, not having a good time. Sarah's aunt also testified against her at trial, uh, the aunt that she was living with after her parents were killed. And the prosecution asked her aunt if Sarah had ever talked about the insurance money because the prosecution believed that she wanted the money and that was part of her motivation for committing the murders. And her aunt said that the only time she brought it up was when she was upset and she would talk about how her brother was going to get everything and she wasn't going to get anything, anything, anything. Couldn't get that word out. My mouth's not working. I need some water. So there was one other person who testified against Sarah at trial who I think, I think their testimony should be taken with a grain of salt because of who it's coming from. But I thought that it was interesting and telling and explained a couple of things. So I thought it was at least worth mentioning. Now, this person who testified against Sarah was a convicted felon. This was a woman who was in jail for drugs named Melinda Gonzalez. And she had been in jail with Sarah while Sarah awaited trial for murdering her parents. So they became friends and they would talk. And she said that Sarah was pretty open with her about her relationship with her parents, that she would talk about the fights, that she would talk about how intense they would get, how much she absolutely hated her mother. And she talked about how she was a daddy's girl, that she loved her dad, but that if both her parents were to die, she would get the whole $500,000 of the life insurance policy because her brother wasn't her dad's real son. Don't know if that's true. That could have just been made up by anybody. I, I don't know, it's, it's fucked up to say but it's what Melinda said that Sarah said. She also said that Sarah would slip up a lot about the murders, very much like she had been the one that committed them. She was pulling up. Did you ever see that interview? If you've seen my OJ Simpson video, you would know that I talked about this in the OJ Simpson video, but OJ Simpson did an interview when he was talking about the book he wrote, the If I Did It book, where he would slip up a lot and be like, oh yeah, I remember then I did this and did it. Like he would go into that default of speaking because he fucking did it allegedly. Um, and Sarah would do the same thing. She would be like, oh, when I killed, I mean, when the uh, other people killed my parents, this happened, like she would slip up. She'd have slip ups of the tongue often, which I found very interesting. And she also said that Sarah explained the knives, the knives that were found in the bedroom. Because you remember I said that there were some random knives that were found at the crime scene and that police were not really able to determine why they had been there since nobody had been stabbed to death. Well, Sarah said that she had them in there, that there was three knives, one knife for each member of the family, one for her mother, one for her father, one for her, because she wanted to look like, she wanted it, the murders at first, to look like a group of people had come into that house to murder her entire family. One for her, one for her mom, one for her dad, and that she had just gotten away. Is this true? I don't know, but I thought it was interesting. The defense however, thought the prosecution's case was weak, which I disagree with, but they did have one point that they made a lot that did make me go, hmm. And this was that they didn't believe, they didn't believe then, and apparently her attorney still doesn't believe that Sarah is guilty. Like he still tried to help her for like years after she was arrested because he didn't think she had done it. And their biggest reason for this was that when Sarah ran to the neighbor's house after the murders happened, she was completely sans blood. Like there was not a speck of blood on her body. And they did not believe that it was possible that she could have committed the type of murder she committed and not have a single drop of blood on her. He was like, not on her hair, not on her earlobes, nothing. There was nothing. And I mean, is it possible that she could have cleaned up after the fact? Maybe, I, I don't know. I don't know how much time there was between the gunshots, like neighbors hearing shots and her ending up at the neighbor's house. I also tend to think that if that was the case, there'd be evidence of a cleanup, like in the shower or in the sink. Um, but even with that said, it is still sketchy that her, her DNA was on the robe and on the gloves, particularly the gloves. Um, but then again, she did live in that house, so she had all the access for her DNA to be on everything. Her attorney just kept driving home the point that there was no blood, so there was no guilt. He did a very, another OJ thing, a very like, if the glove, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. The glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. If there's no blood, there's no guilt. That was his whole point. Like, there's no way she could have done this without getting blood on her, so therefore she did not do this. And he ended up saying, of the crime scene, and I quote, 
Her mother's head literally exploded in a spherical fashion. The gun itself had blood on it. Yet there was none on her. Absolutely none. The prosecution and the defense went back and forward on this blood thing because it is like definitely something worth discussing because I would imagine that she would have blood on her too. They had like a reenactment done at one point um, to just show how bloody it would be. But the judge ended up saying that they couldn't show this at trial because it wasn't, I don't know exactly why they wouldn't let him show it at trial, but the, the judge was like, no, you're not showing this at trial. But even in my head, I would imagine with what happened to her mother's head, there would be blood on her. And the expert for the defense testified that he could not at all see a way that it would be possible for this murder to have been committed without some sort of spatter, some sort of misting being on the killer. And he said of this, and I quote, I concluded that the shooter was in such proximity to the explosive environment that produced misted blood that he would have either had blood spatter on his person or on his items of clothing. And the defense showed many very gruesome shots of the crime scene just to illustrate how bloody and how messy this crime scene really was. And this was one of the only times during the trial because Sarah was pretty stoic. That bitch was like locked and loaded. She was not very emotional, but during the part where they showed these photos, she did actually sob. One other thing that Sarah's a defense attorney did that I thought was like, I get why he did it, but it's also a little dumb is he tried to introduce the idea that even though Bruno didn't pull the trigger, he could have still been the mastermind behind the murders. Um, and Sarah not be involved at all. He said because Bruno was a criminal and a drug dealer that he could have people that were working for him that could have gone and actually committed this murder for him, right? But he chose not to put Bruno on the stand and not to question him at all, which I think weakens his theory personally, but that's just me. Before the jury was sent to deliberate, the judge asked Sarah if she would like to testify on her own behalf and tell her side of the story and try to, you know, say whatever it was that she felt like she could say before they went in to decide if she was guilty of murdering her parents. And she just quietly was like, no, I do not. And when she responded with no, I do not, her family members, people sitting in the courtroom just kind of shook their head in disbelief and probably disappointment because they just wanted to hear what she had to say for herself. After a five week trial, the jury was sent out to deliberate and decide if the 16 year old Sarah Marie Johnson was guilty of murdering both of her parents. After 11 hours of deliberation, the jury returned on March 1st, 2005, ready to give their decision. And Sarah Johnson's hands and body trembled visibly as she waited for them to read the verdict. And the verdict was that Sarah Marie Johnson was guilty on both counts of first degree murder. Before her sentencing, family and friends made their pleas um, to the court for what sort of sentence they believed that she should get. And most of them said that she should get life in prison, that they didn't think she should ever get out of jail. Even her own brother, Matt, agreed with the sentiment. Um, and he read a pretty heartfelt statement to her. He had written it down, but he said out loud, like he wrote something down, but he mostly wanted to speak candidly um, and only really looked at his notes to keep him on track. And he said to the court and to his sister mostly, and I quote, Sarah, mom and dad treated you like a princess. I don't know why you threw it away. Of all the things I miss, I miss their hugs, their bear hugs. And judge, I would like to see the maximum because after tomorrow and you read your sentencing, I don't ever want to hear about her or this event ever again. He said this through tears and she listened through tears. Sarah's grandmother, so Diane's mother, also made a statement to the court, mostly speaking directly to Sarah, just begging for an explanation, some closure, and letting Sarah know that despite everything, she still loved her. Sarah's attorney asked the court to just give her 15 years. And he said of, like his explanation for his recommendation was, and I quote, if you give her fixed life, all the opportunity to utilize the parole system and give her an opportunity to work towards parole, to have the hope to be successful in the future, to return to the community as a productive person. If you give her fixed life, you take all that away. Sarah also finally spoke to the court herself during the, the penalty phase. She wanted to speak on her own behalf. She wouldn't do this during the trial, only during her penalty phase um, before learning her fate. And she said to the court, and I quote, I loved my parents and I love my family. 
I am deeply grieving the loss of my parents as well as the loss as my family, my home, my friends, and my community. With the guidance of the Lord and the continued love and support of those who believe in me, I hope to rebuild my life and prove that I can be a productive member of society. In the end, Sarah Johnson was given two consecutive life sentences for her crimes, plus an additional 15 years with no possibility of parole. And after the verdict, not the verdict, the sentencing was read, her family um, hugged each other and cried. After giving Sarah her sentence, the judge spoke to the court for an hour about his reasoning behind the sentence he chose. And he spoke a lot of that time to Sarah directly. And he said to Sarah um, about his reasoning for the sentencing he gave her. And I quote, you had it all. You had a nice family, nice school, car, freedom. You had it all. In the final analysis, you had lots of options. You had all kinds of ways to not go down this road. And yet you elected the worst possible courses of conduct. And it's the most devastating, harshest option. Are you a safety risk? There's a lot of evidence here to suggest that you are a significant safety risk. I have come down on the side of protection of society in this risk analysis. The risk to society outweighs your individual needs and wants. This particular judge is a self-proclaimed big believer in probation and rehabilitation, but understands that some things can't be rehabilitated and some people can't be saved. And he believes that this, that Sarah is one of these people. And he said of this, and I quote, I'm a big believer in hope, but there's certain conduct that crosses the line. We're not talking, for instance, about a residue methamphetamine case. We're talking about one of the most severe crimes known to man. There is evidence that indicates she's not seeking rehabilitation, that she's just trying to get off. It's all about Sarah and it's all about Sarah now. He continued by asking Sarah, why? Why? It's the ring that can't be taken out of the bell. Everyone in this room is asking why, why, why? It defies explanation, except for the explanation of your selfish protection of your relationship with your former boyfriend. No one saw this coming. All of those things in my mind contribute to a significant risk of danger. A lesser sentence would trivialize these two lies. Society cannot tolerate and will not tolerate a child rebelling against their parents and killing them. The very people who were trying to protect you. After all was said and done, a member of the defense gave a signed statement to the Times News that apparently was written by Sarah. And it said, and I quote, I am grieving the loss of my parents. I have lost my family, my home, my friends, and my community. I want to thank the people who believe in me and support me, especially my guardian and adoptive family. Sarah's grandmother, so Diane's mother, um, says that she struggles very much with coming to terms with the fact that her granddaughter murdered her daughter, um, coming to terms with that and what that means and what that does to her and how that feels. And she said of this, and I quote, it's indescribable. It really is the heartbreak and the sorrow. Alan's sister said of the verdict against Sarah, and I quote, we lost another member of the family today. Sarah's friends are also in disbelief that this happened and that she would make this decision because Sarah, they're the same age. So they're seeing how young Sarah really is and that she threw her life away for nothing. Like she's never going to have a life. She's never going to get married. She's never going to get to move out. She's never going to get to have kids. She's never get to have, she's never going to get to have a life. She threw it away for nothing. And now she's stuck in jail in a cell for the rest of her life. And she refuses to see friends or family. So she's just totally alone. And now for a sort of like, where are they now moment or a where were they then moment, like updates that have happened since then is in 2012, um, Sarah tried to file a petition, I believe for a new trial stating that she had ineffective counsel in her initial trial. Um, and she cited the fact that there was no blood on her, which her original attorney had already done. And she also cited the fact that her fingerprints weren't on the murder weapon and that the only fingerprints on the murder weapon belonged to the gentleman, the tenant who lived in the house. So maybe he was guilty, but it was already determined that like he was gone and it was his gun. So of course his fingerprints are on it. Um, 
and of course, like this was denied. She didn't get the new trial. In 2017, Sarah also tried to get her life sentence reduced due to the new ruling on life sentences for juveniles being like, not it fam, if you remember. Um, the court did agree that the recent US Supreme Court rulings forbid mandatory life sentences for juveniles, but her conviction ended up being with upheld because they said that those rulings didn't impact Sarah's case because the sentencing judge had considered her jade, her jade, her age as a mitigating factor before sentencing, sentencing her to life in prison. And apparently the U S Supreme court left it up to the States um, on how they wanted to enforce these new restrictions. So, and since then, I believe Sarah has now exhausted all of her appeals. So she is in jail forever for life. Um, and that is what her family wants. So that's that. Yeah. And now I want to end this video with a little bit of information about Sarah's grandmother, Diane's mother, because I feel like this illustrates just how lasting the pain and the trauma of a murder like this is on the people who loved these people, because I just feel like heartbreak in this woman. And it, and it really, really like, just like will hit you right in the chest because when, when these things happen, they don't just affect the people immediately involved, the victims and the killer, it affects everybody. And I think this is a good example of that. Diane's mother said that from time to time, ooh, <laughs> immediately my eyes got all like, oh, like welled up. Don't do it. Um, Diane's mother says that from time to time, she'll get upset. She'll feel herself get upset about something going on in her life and that she'll just hear her daughter's voice in her head telling her, mom, don't sweat the small stuff. And that that's like, how she remembers her daughter and who her daughter was her just being like a positive uplifting person in her life that helped keep her centered. And as she started to say this, she, she just started to sob and it broke my heart. <laughs> no, that's that. And with that last little bit of information that my friends is the story of the murder of Alan and Diane Johnson. Isn't that just so fucked up to be murdered? so brutally, like the way that they described it, man, especially with her mother to be killed so brutally. And then to have the person who killed you like that be your own child, the person that you've given everything for your time, energy, youth, love. As a parent, you give up everything for your kids if you are a good parent, right? And it sounds like Alan and Diane did just that. These two people worked super hard to ensure that they and their kids had the best life. And it sounds like Sarah did. She's described as being treated like a princess and she murdered the very people who gave her that sweet life for no reason. And that's so messed up. I am genuinely curious if there are any of you out there who do believe that Sarah is innocent. Cause I do know that the lack of blood on her is odd. It did come out that Sarah was very into watching true crime shows. So it is possible that she had picked up some tips and tricks on how to lessen the transfer of evidence um, to keep herself clean. I could picture her then wearing those gloves, one on each hand, putting her robe on backwards. It was determined that the robe was worn backwards during the murder, by the way. I don't even think I mentioned that, but like it was put on backwards. So it would cover more surface area. Um, she could have put that shower cap that was found flushed down the toilet. I'm pretty sure I mentioned that there was a shower cap that was flushed down the toilet that was found, put that over her hair to again, stop there being as much blood. So really at that point, all that's showing is like wrists and face, um, murdered her parents and then did a quick face wash and hand wash before running out of the house, screaming to the neighbors, you know, but that's just a theory. I don't know if that's how it happened. And I'm very curious as to what you think if you, or if anybody out there thinks that Sarah is innocent, please let me know down below. And if you do think she's innocent, let me know your theories of what you think actually happened. I'm very curious. We'll call it the question of the day and let me know down below your answer. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative and it gave you all of the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, as always, thank you for hanging out and remembering Alan and Diane with me today. They sounded like completely wonderful people who, were taken too early and whose loss is felt immensely by those who loved them. Most of all, you know, their son who lost both of his parents for absolutely no reason. 
it's incredibly tragic and sad and you can't take it back. And they are definitely worth discussing and remembering. Of course, please let me know down below of any cases you would like to see me cover in the future. As this one indicates, if you leave me a suggestion, I will try to get to it. And if I do get to your suggestion, I will give you a shout out for your suggestion. That's what I try to do every time. Um, I love hearing about the cases that you guys are into because you guys have some good suggestions. And I know that you have some good suggestions because you have good suggestions and good taste. Otherwise you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media will be listed down below along with um, links to all the makeup I used, but I didn't put on makeup today <laughs> because I got carpal tunnel in pregnancy and multitasking is hard. But I will link down below my merch store um, in case you want to check that out. There's some shirts on there. So that's something uh if you're interested and anyways with all of that said i just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world that is tight you are tight please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday and i hope to see you in my next video bye